And with us now, the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, and the president of the National Action Network and host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you for both for being here this morning. Jonathan, um, tell us, if you will, just what these last few days have, have been like for you and why it's so important that you are appearing here today with the Reverend Sharpton. Well, so I will be honest and maybe a little more vulnerable than I normally would be. These have been some of the hardest days of my adult life. I don't ever remember a moment like this. Um, I have family in Israel right now under siege and being deployed to the front lines. I have staff who can't locate their family. I have friends who are gone. Um, and I think Ambassador Danone put it well in a context that Americans can understand 9-11, the evil that was perpetrated here. But the scale, Jonathan, the right comparison is Nagasaki. This was like an atomic bomb. And as 40,000 people were killed in Japan when they dropped that bomb in Nagasaki, so too were the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people who were killed in Israel. And so while I am sad and cope, trying to cope, I'll be honest, I am angry. I am angry with the world that allowed the dehumanization of Israelis and sanitized the terrorism of Hamas. I must say, I love this show and I love this network. But I've got to ask, who is writing the scripts? Hamas, the people who did this, they are not fighters, Jonathan. They are not militants. And I'm looking right at the camera. They are terrorists. It is a barbarian who rapes and brutalizes women, who tear, kills children in front of their parents, and then brings them over to Gaza, who literally, we've heard all these reports, and we know these aren't just reports, these were filmed gleefully by the barbarians who committed these grotesque crimes. They filmed, for example, an elderly woman in her home in one of these towns. They burned her alive in her house because she was too infirm to take out. And, you know, parading women, bleeding from the crotch because they were raped throughout Gaza while people hoot and holler and cheer. So look, you know, when we say, oh, this was an escalation, it was bound to happen, I am sorry. This was a massacre that was pre-planned. This was not destined to happen. It is not normal to shoot teenagers in the back, hundreds of them. So I just think, like, guys, get this story right. And all these pictures of, like, you know, m missiles or the rubble in Gaza, please talk to the Israeli mothers and fathers who lost their children. Talk to the grandchildren whose grandparents were seized as hostages. And please stop calling this a retaliation. This is a defensive measure against an organization that is committed to one thing, killing Jews, not a peaceful resolution of a conflict, but murdering Jews. And if you're wondering if I'm exaggerating, please, I beg of you, everyone watching and everyone at this network, just watch the footage. So, Rev. Shrapton, more than 200 people, 200 bodies found at that music festival, many of them young people, teenagers. Many of them teenagers at a peace festival. When I saw some of the footage uh, Saturday morning, I, I called Jonathan. Why did I call Jonathan? Uh, because, first of all, he and uh, ADL and other groups had co-chaired the March on Washington uh, with us in August with Martin Luther King III, Andrea Waters King. And we said we wanted to fight together hate crimes. We later met with President Biden, Vice President Harris. I immediately thought about how since that march, Jonathan Greenblatt got on a plane with me and went to Florida, Jacksonville, where a black woman was one of three killed in a hate crime. So if we're going to be about dealing with hate and violence, we've got to do it on all sides. You cannot say, stand with me, but I'm not going to stand with you. And then when I see people marching in midtown Manhattan with Nazi signs, 
it's Jews today, it's blacks tomorrow. Hitler would have killed all of us. That's right. So for you to come to a a rally would not see signs and they not be denounced. You're not talking about an escalation. You are sending a clear signal to us would not see signs, which is why many of the civil rights organizations signed with us, National Action Network, National Urban League, NAACP, uh, National Negro Women, uh, uh, count all of us denouncing this violence. I must also say this, um, Jonathan, and I, I and I told this to uh, Jonathan Greenblatt uh, in 2001 when 9/11 happened, which he referred to. I was in New York. I called Mort Zuckerman, uh, who used to own a, a place uh, you used to work, who was then the head of the Conference of Jewish Presidents. Presidents. Yeah, yeah. And I said to him, "This is outrageous. I had members of my organization's parents killed in in the war, uh, World Trade Building. These are civilians. It had nothing to do with the uh, differences in." policy. I said, I want to go to Israel and show now I understand what it means about civilians being killed. He arranged it. Sharon uh, uh, Perez, who was then the foreign minister, hosted me, had me come. He asked me in the meeting, would I go see Yas Arafat and talk about it? And I went to Gaza and at his setting it up, met with Arafat. Arafat was talking about how bin Laden was wrong on what he did on 9-11. When I look at what happened yesterday, and Saturday and deal with even Arafat talked about what are you dealing with when you just indiscriminately kill civilians. We're talking about people that were at a concert. We're talking about elders in their home. How can anybody talk about their human rights activists and not stand up against this? Right. And to be clear, there a person could levy criticisms on the current Israeli government, but also denounce terrorism. These are acts of terrorism. Um, Jonathan, yeah. put this in, in context for us uh, that this that this violence comes Amid, we have seen, we've been on the show yes, so many know, times, a surge of anti-Semitism, both at home and abroad. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Jewish people around the world are feeling vulnerable in this moment. Anti-Semitic incidents have reached an all-time high, at least since we've been tracking it, for the last 45 years. And so synagogues and offices and people's homes, a kosher supermarket overnight in uh, London was vandalized. So whether it's harassment or vandalism or violence, Jews are feeling a kind of exogenous pressure we haven't seen before. And we know that incidents in the Middle East tend to spark violence here. We saw it in 2021 when Jews were bashed and assaulted in broad daylight in Times Square in West Hollywood, in South Florida, after Hamas previously lobbed missiles at Israel. And so the thing that's so challenging and vexing about this is people are saying, well, could this escalate into a wider war? It is a wider war. This is Al-Qaeda, from, from Al-Qaeda to ISIS to Hamas. This is what Islamic radicalism, jihadism looks like. Again, it doesn't seek a peaceful resolution of a conflict. This was not some inevitable outcome. This was a pre-planned massacre. And how did they send thousands of missiles into Israel? Because they were supplied by Iran. And we will ask those questions. We will wonder about how that failure happened. But I saw David Ignatius whose journalism I so deeply respect and whose reporting I appreciate. And he said, you know, they will look at, was this an intelligence failure, a military failure? Jonathan, this was the West's failure. This was our failure for decades to allow Iran and its proxies to dehumanize Zionists and Jews, to allow people to think on college campuses at Harvard, to allow anti-Zionism to flourish. We saw this in the 30s legitimate professors, students who came to believe the poison of the Third Reich, who came to think that in the wake of World War I, the Jews had literally abandoned Germany. And remember what, history, what Hitler said, it's the Jews who caused their own misfortune. Now we have Palestinian Hamas apologists and their acolytes here in the West, their accomplices. Jonathan saying, Israel brought this on, blaming the victim while we're still collecting the bodies, is as disgraceful and as dishonorable a thing as I could ever imagine. The last thing I'll say, and I'm so sorry, but I, I don't ever remember feeling like this before, is that the idea, the notion that somehow this peace, this rapprochement with Saudi Arabia, the, they were trying to disrupt it, I think there's some truth to that. But let's be clear, that was a path to peace working out a deal that could have given the Palestinians the, and the Israelis the confidence to make a deal with the Palestinians. Terror reinforces 
terror reinforces the conflict because that's what these these barbarians want. We've got to stand up against them every time. Katie Kay. Jonathan, um, there are reports coming out that this operation may have been two years in the planning. Mm -hmm. uh, Axios has a story this morning that uh, Hamas had even built a mock of an Israeli settlement inside Gaza and was using it to train it. I mean, the level of sophistication of the planning seems to be extraordinary. What does this do to Israelis' sense of security? Because there had, over the last few years, I think, Israelis had developed a sense of believing that between Mossad and the IDF and the security services, they were well protected, that they, um, that they had a force that they could rely on to know Thank what you. was happening in the region. Do you think this disrupts that sense of security in their own forces? Well, a few things. So, number one, this didn't start two years ago, Caddy. It started in 1979 with the Islamic Revolution in Iran that made destroying Israel. That was one of Khomeini's precepts. So let's just start there. After the peace treaty with Egypt, the Islamic Revolution was founded in part to reclaim all of historic Palestine. So it started in 79, the planning number. Because again, Hamas is Iran. Let's get that right, number one. Number two, if they were training, it wasn't on a mock Israeli settlement, Caddy. It was an Israeli town where boys and girls played in playgrounds, where mothers and daughters brought their children to school, where people worked and lived. It was a town, not a settlement. Because to Hamas, all of Israel is a settlement, okay? And then thirdly, will this hurt Israeli sense of, um, if you will, security? Israel is a country like any other. You can only build walls that are so high. None of them can be impregnable. So yes, I'm sure that Israelis will be concerned about how do we def defend ourselves, but I will tell you this, the resolve and strength of Israel and the Jewish people, Hamas, ha you know, excuse me, Gaza is not now under siege. Israel has been under siege for 75 years. Some would say the Jewish people for 2000 years. Our resolve is unbreakable. And we will face this down, the Israelis will face this down with the ferocity this situation merits.